Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of Momentum Monday. Today, we're covering Cocos and Commodities' ludicrous run, Adobe's disastrous earnings report, the degen action coming out of Robinhood. Is it the end of the road for certain EV companies? And finally, we'll wrap up with Palantir's CEO's wild comments on short sellers. Then we'll take a big picture look at indexes and what's happening in markets, and then finally respond to the Stockwoods community's top questions, and then wrap up as always with our stock picks for the week. My name is Tommy Trampo, and with us again is the chart wizard himself, Ivan Hoff, and the unicorn genius king, Howard Lindzen. All right, so for this week, you're starting off with Coco. It has been going absolutely bonkers and not on nearly enough people's radar. So Ivan, what the hell is happening with these commodities? And you know, should we be paying attention to this action? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty crazy. Uh, this is a chart of, can you see that? The chart of yeah. Coco uh, for the past few years. It doubled in 2023, doubled in 2024 so far, uh, so far. And it's just, there's been a destruction of uh, demand. Uh, and supply has, uh, you know, it's about the same, uh, growing every year a little bit. But there is a famine going on in uh, in cocoa beans, and um, which only you know comes to show us that uh, uh, the world is not prepared for, uh, for for famine in some of the some of those uh, staples. Uh, and it's not just uh, just cocoa. Obviously, we've seen a rise in orange juice, uh, in uh, in sugar. But if you think about it, a hundred or so years ago, uh, farmers around the world used to grow like a hundred different kinds of bananas, potatoes, wheat, um, anything you can think of. You know, there were a hundred different kinds. And then over time, they decided to focus on only one or two types. There are the one that have the highest output, the one that are the tastiest, that the consumer like the most. And by concentrating and focusing so much on just one or two sorts, uh, we've become a lot more vulnerable uh, to famine. And in the past four years, there be, there's been a famine in, in cocoa beans and uh, there's mm -hmm. been a destruction in supply. So I know this is not something uh, that many people care about, but eventually, you know, you, you see it in, in the consumer prices. So it's something to be aware of. Uh, and I mean, this is a pretty, it's probably, this is the, the chart of the year so far. It's not Bitcoin, it's not uh, NVIDIA or... or <laughs> For semiconductors, it's cocoa beans. It's doubled here to date. Oh. How <laughs> good, good, good synopsis. I, I think this just tells a story about you know price action and why everybody who gets the market bug, um, like you, Tommy, loves the markets. How can you not look at this and go forgetting <laughs> the fundamentals behind it, Brian? Um, it's you know, the only thing when I see this chart is I get sad that in high school and elementary school, kids aren't learning about price action and markets and how market behavior, you know, I think about <clears throat> my son, Max, he's 22. He came to me one day, he was playing golf with the buddy, uh, Dave, you know, started, uh, um, he started a company called, uh, senior moment bleacher report so i said son you're gonna play golf with them and uh, he comes back uh this kid has been in school and knows knows about things but you know in university he comes to me he goes dad he's very wealthy and i said uh oh you know because they google these kids google names he googles a name and tells you what he sold his bleacher report company to time warner and you know, he got the numbers all wrong because he assumed the dollar amount that he sold the company for all went to Dave Finocchio. And I had to explain to him at 22 that if you got to first factor in how much of the VCs took, then you got to factor in, you know, uh, you know, his employees and everything. And by the end of it, he's got maybe five to 10 percent of his company after 10 years. Right. And that lesson taught him everything he needed about, you know, how this stuff works. It's like, don't you got to break everything down. And and the markets do that for people too. It's like when you study these price charts, you people can pick up on this stuff very quickly, whether it's different markets. So Coco, listen, if you're following price action back in 2023, you saw some massive breakout out of a base. Uh, you didn't have to know much about Coco. Uh, what do you do here? I don't know. I think commodities have a tendency to uh, find supply. 
uh, when there's demand, whether it's oil going negative and, and people realizing demand is not going away forever, or when it's cocoa tripling or quadrupling over three years and people realizing, we'll find some cocoa. So that's what you have to remember with commodities versus stocks is, uh, e- even in stocks, same thing, uh, that when there's uh, supply, uh, demand will show up. And when there's too much demand, supply will show up. So uh, be careful chasing it there. So while cocoa might have been probably the hottest looking chart of the year, obviously the hottest trend is still everything to do with AI. And Adobe released what seemed to be like pretty solid earnings, but the market absolutely destroyed the stock following the report. Is this a continued reaction to the continuing AI story and the fact that you know, there's going to be a lot of disruption in the image generation and image creation space? Well, I'll, I'll take it. Listen, I mean, company's only going to get stronger with AI. The question is, you know, didn't grow enough. Um, you know, I, these are big companies priced per perfection. And if it's only going to, you know, be flat on earnings, um, you know, it's still going to be trading today at 30 times earnings, right? Which is, you know, not cheap if a company is not growing. Um, but this is, you know, if you believe in Adobe long term, then you want you want things like this. You want 30, 40 percent pullbacks uh, because they're going to be more dominant from AI. Uh, so I don't know. You know, trend is broken. Um, the growth. Uh, what a run. Uh, I doubt Adobe is going away much like into it. A lot of these vertical software companies that dominant uh, can surprise you. So, you know, I, I haven't met an Adobe user with AI that didn't love from Om Malik and all the Photoshop guys, I haven't met a person with that doesn't that doesn't have something great to say about using Photoshop with AI. So, but yeah, I wouldn't buy this stock right here. Okay, so um, I mean, the market is forward looking. People are looking at you know the good earnings that they reported and saying how come it it sold off. They beat the estimates. Well, uh, those estimates. <clears throat> And those earnings, they show the previous quarter, they show the past, which was probably already kind of reflected. What we, we need to mention here is that Adobe actually guided down significantly for, for next quarter, for next year. And this is why we see that reaction. So the market is just discounting that guidance. And it just could last only a quarter and then it could bounce back. Uh, we don't know. So far, I, yeah, I wouldn't touch it here. To, I, I would wait for some... Uh, buyers to uh, to show up even though that's a pretty big level here 500 but if you pull up a lot of these software stocks are you know have have done well and they're just slowly rolling over if you look at igv you know i think it's it's kind of similar for the whole sector just a little bit rolling over here but you know adobe obviously worse than the other ones so be careful here in software you know a cloudflare had a great breakout but like give it back a lot of the gains net so it's kind of like you know, when you gap up on earnings, NET. I'm oh, sorry. So, yeah. So, so the sector itself, uh, you know, say, look at that gap up. You don't want to see those kind of. Now, Cloudflare could be a great buy here. That's one I'm actually watching. But, like, you don't want to see those gap ups get quickly sold off. So, this is something that pay attention to, whereas there's some rotation and software doesn't look good at all. So over this last few weeks, we're starting to see just some more volatility, you know, entering the market. And one of the best reflections of that is Robinhood released their trading data for February trading volumes. And it was off the charts bananas with just the amount of options being traded, just the amount of retail interest you know, going on within the platform right now. You know, what does this tell you about where we're at right now in markets? Uh, this is not I'll chime. Go ahead. Just because it's near and dear to my heart. Let's pull up a longer term chart we can right so you 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 left for dead including myself right my biggest problem with robin hood as a early investor is you know that that's basically given up on the company is you know vision and direction right the the wallet size is small right they never they never use that early advantage of opening those millions accounts to attract wallet size and it's hard not to chase revenue and the revenue they've chased is fringy at best. You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a millionaire and I don't trade options. Right. I'm, I'm so I don't give a shit about options. Right. Uh, I think people should trade them. Great. But I wanted, 
you know, carousel of opening 10 accounts here. Well, I, for me, when I invested in Robinhood, I was like Schwab, let's be Schwab. Let's go um, not chase commissions, let's chase wallet share. And because you, it's such a gift to be able to acquire users uh, during that ZERP era. So the question to me long-term for Robinhood is, can they turn these 20, 100,000, you know, these 20, five to $100,000 accounts into million dollar accounts? And I don't see that yet. Right. I see a lot of other products that are solving that. And I don't see Robinhood solving that. I see them and, and the stock kind of feeds that. Right. The they get the positive reinforcement of having a great quarter. What? Because of options trading. Uh, what happens when the VIX goes to 30 the next time? Right. And this, you know, so I worry, you know, how you're getting paid versus Coinbase. If we pull up Coinbase, there's no options. There's speculation, but they, they own their business. They they really are executing. If you look at the lows, um, where, where Robinhood would hit the lows, Coinbase is up six x off the lows. Robinhood's up eighty, you know, eighty percent. So I think, you know, will Robinhood play catch up to Coinbase, or will is this kind of a peak in 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 um, speculation short term? So I worry about how you, how Robinhood's, you know, behaving based on on this price action. Go ahead, Ivan. I mean, I was going to say that the, the, that report from Robinhood wasn't really surprising. We talked about it a few weeks ago when uh, prices were going higher and we knew that, you know, people were going to speculate and be more active. So nothing surprising in those reports. And there is a reason Coinbase and Robinhood are one of the best performers uh, for the past few weeks uh, as uh, anything crypto related, uh, market related has been on fire. So, I mean, let me so yeah, let's sorry. Go ahead. Ivan. Yeah, we, we don't know if this will be a longer term move. Uh, so far for me, it's just a shorter term uh, burst. But, you know, as a swing trader, that's what I care about, like capturing those short term, you know, 5 to 20, 30 percent moves. Um, so, yeah, that's all I have. Uh, just a quick thought on Robin, if you pull back the chart, um, love to see them announce with the valuation now, the market cap is 16 billion. So it's about where it was when I sold some stock back in 2016, 2017, right? So I'd love to see them use this market cap, you know, relative to the rest of FinTech to do some acquisitions, to fill out the product line, to offer me services that I can move more capital there. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, right now it's a question of what does management do with this, you know, jacked up stock price. I know, I'm sure management thinks, oh, we were once $50 a share. Uh, let's hope to get that back. But, you know, part of being a great public company is also having strategy around when to do acquisitions and when to grow your company in areas that you're not growing, not just options. So I think this is a pivotal moment for Robinhood. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, on one hand, you're looking at companies like Robinhood that are sitting on lots of cash, have lots of options to do, you know, with their future. Like, you know, things are, things are, there's a probability that they figured this stuff out. You know, on the other hand, you know, one of the other narratives we've been talking a lot about is the declining recently of what's happening in the EV markets. And I think we're starting to see a lot of that starting to come to head as Fisker bankruptcy rumors started to hit mainstream. You know, that stock saw another 50 percent drawdown. I think you are the Thursday or Friday when that when that news started to hit. Um, you know, are, are we just is this the fully washing out of the last people who are all trying to chase uh, the you know, previous cycles trends? And and what do you see as still as, a, as the future of the EV markets here? That with Fisker, let me say that I, I, I'm not so much good at picking stocks, but I've seen shitty stocks. Okay, <laughs> like okay, patterns you know on the upside are not that much different than patterns on the downside. Right, it's very hard to change momentum when a stock is going up, but eventually, law of large numbers, even if it's Apple, kick in. On a stock that's going backwards, uh, I remember posting on Fisker without any knowledge of the company when I saw the chart break down to five and four and three. That like people like i just saw the cult like behavior of people in the stream that kind of hope that like weird belief and and i didn't know it would spread to the rest of evs to be honest because i was just fascinated by the the when when companies are really breaking and and i see it on stock tips and i've seen hundreds of them over the years um they do the same thing and you know people 
get caught up with the product or the story of the CEO. And I'm like, you know, that doesn't matter. What matters is earnings. What matters is basic fundamentals over time. And we just never got them. We just got a lot of hype and promise. And you know what? The one thing these, these people didn't get right, and I've said it before, is you know, young kids, it's just not that convenient to have an electric car, right? This next generation coming up, you know, maybe Ubers, that don't make sense, but uh, and self-driving cars. But when kids go on road trips, uh, it's it's not not easy. So Toyota, um, you know, it, it snuck up on people because of the hybrids and Honda. So again, I think there's just a bunch of things at play here. One of them is the terrible fundamentals of the EV companies, right? At a time when interest rates have risen. So I think I think there's more trouble to come. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, all good points. So it's in general, it's very difficult to um, build a car company from scratch, from the ground up. And we talked about it, how a hundred years ago, there were hundreds of companies, hundreds of car companies, and only three of them survived. And this cycle is not going to be any different uh, for the pure EV companies. And Elon Musk has said that many times, it's probably Tesla and then a few Chinese company will, will survive if you're pure electric. And um, Howard is right about it. There's been a lot more demand for hybrid vehicles around the world just because they're just more practical. Yeah, and, and I'll say this, you know, someone who can afford a, a car, I still like the sound of a Porsche. And you're not going to get me to switch to an EV. You know, I'm not, that, I'm not a bad human because I drive a Porsche. I like the sound of it. The other thing is what made Tesla great and it's probably Elon Musk, is he took, he diversified, right? He, he used, he's using Tesla as a way to launch himself into space. So, so Tesla is not his only child. I'd be, you know, I'd be very careful. I'm a Tesla shareholder. Remember that, like his, his, his butter now is being, or his bread is now being buttered by SpaceX and, and Starlink. And, you know, as it, it's just very hard to run two companies, let alone four or five. Uh, very few people have, if count on my hand, the amount of people that could run two companies. So I'm, I'm very wary of, first of all, this trend catching up to Tesla, right? It's yes. I agree with Ivan that Tesla will survive, but that doesn't mean the stock can't go to 50 and he can't still be the richest guy in the world because of uh, SpaceX and Starlink. So, you know, the fans, the fans should be careful. You know, it's very hard for one chart to outperform the rest of the industry. So you know, one of the other big stories that you know, came out of last week is that there are more stocks with cult followings. And one of the biggest ones t- to this day is Palantir. And you know they're being led by their kind of wacky CEO, this Alex Karp guy, who went on CNBC you know, last week and you know, called out all the short sellers saying, you guys are only shorting our stocks to you know, make profit for your Coke habits and whatnot. You know, w- what is your general reaction to you know, when a CEO makes comments like that targeted short sellers and, and all that stuff? Like, is, that, is that noise? Like, what, what is your reaction? First of all, I own the stock uh, and I've never accused people so when I, the thesis on the streams when I bought the stock in 20 or 19 and 18 <clears throat> was that I truly believe in this defense boom, right, as, as countries look inward. Uh, but I don't do Coke. This is, a, this is a product that I love, Trident Coffee, I'm pimping one of my companies. Um, this is a Neutronic, and, and I've even got to try this mushroom cold brew coffee, Trident. They're a local, local company with uh, Navy SEAL. Uh, Navy SEAL guys backed it. Um, but... I don't know. That's a really bad look. I didn't. I can't watch stuff like this. Right? I I can't watch myself on video. Uh, I could watch you two guys all day, but I would hope someone would say something to me. You know, there's just as a grown person, um, that's how the markets work. Short sellers, and if you execute well as a company, you want short sellers, right? That is fuel for good fundamentals. Right. And if you have great fundamentals, short sellers are your best friend. So as a as a shareholder, I, I, I got to say that I'm considering exiting. You know, I don't need aggravation or someone that sounds that dumb. Now, there's other stuff at play. Um, you know, I there's a lot of people in crypto that must be on Coke based on what I, mean. <laughs> I, I don't think Coke users look to short sell. They generally tend to be people that dig in 
for very good reasons, because the risk of being short on any stock is just multiple of times riskier than being long a stock. A stock can only go to zero, whereas a stock that you're short can go to infinity, whether it was Qualcomm or a crypto stock or Coco. Um, so I, I definitely hate seeing that. I do think MicroStrategy and some of these stocks that have done great have had tons of short sellers, but guess what? Why did MicroStrategy stock do good in front of short sellers? Because his fundamentals of buying Bitcoin were correct, you know, however you like to say it. So he's now thrilled that there are short sellers there because they're kind of betting against his fundamentals of Bitcoin. So um, not a good look. Sorry, Ivan, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with everything Howard said. Uh, uh, every, every short seller today is a future buyer. And if you really believe in the future of your company and, and its fundamentals, uh, we want short sellers because, you know, they were just going to propel your stock further. And anytime a CEO goes to uh, national TV and complains about short sellers, it, it just worries me. Why would you even uh, acknowledge them? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, let's, let's be honest. If I was on a board of a public company and I've been on the board of late stage companies and I saw behavior like this, and the next board meeting, I go, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what do you know that I don't know? Because it just, I now have to deal with your behavior um, because you're you're basically leaking something um, that now I have to deal with. You want your management team to not cause problems for the board because it's just more people talking about the stock and defending the stock. So terrible decision. But again, if the fundamentals are great, I mean, but, you know, no, I don't even see that not. much short interest, like 1.2 days. It's just short a interest. nonsensical thing to say, but who knows? You know, it's the world. Do you think there's any like self-awareness? You know, he sees a lot of success from Elon doing similar things, drumming up retail, uh, you know, people participating in, in the, you know, is there any side of that where that's being like gainsmanship going on or is it just a dumb move? Don't know. I wouldn't do it. No. All I right. Hope I uh, so it, and I would hope. I would hope someone pulled me aside and slapped me after I do something like that. Because that's the <laughs> way great yeah. management should be. They don't want to screw their shareholders and, 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 and make people distrust kind of your, your, your behavior. Elon's gotten away with it, but that's like one out of a billion. Yeah, that's a wild clip. We'll, we'll link the clip uh, below in the show notes if you, if you haven't seen it yourself. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. All right. So, Ivan, if you want to zoom us out, you know, one of the things we haven't really talked about at all uh, you know, this week is kind of the action happening in crypto. It's been kind of you know, sideways action this week. But if you just look at the you know, bigger picture at what's going on in the indices, kind of what's the vibe of the market right now? It seems like you know, we're, we're looking to pull back a bit here. So is that is that the kind of thing that you're seeing? In, yeah, we're seeing our action? sector rotation um, in Interest rates start, started to perk up uh, last week. Uh, this is the 10-year uh, yield. As you can see, it kind of bounced in the past few days as we received another uh, inflation report that was above estimates. And we saw a couple of those in February. The market didn't care. Then now we're seeing the same in, in March. So the market is starting to care a little bit that maybe um, inflation might be coming back for a little bit, especially right ahead of the FOMC uh, next week, where the Fed is ex expected to be a little bit more hawkish. And um, so definitely we saw rotation into in inflation-related uh, uh, sectors, like energy was super strong. It's been, you know, going up straight uh, for the past two weeks. Uh, basic materials, you know, anything from, from copper, from copper to gold has been super strong. So definitely rotation into um basic materials while the tech is pulling back and um in a in a typical bull market that's that's a healthy rotation as long as it's you know doesn't last for too long and so far it's just it's just a slight pullback when the leaders are pulling back and there's some rotation into uh into energy and basic materials um so that's what we have so far uh on the big picture side just a rotation yeah Good rotation. I was saying um, European financials, uh, Peru, which may be copper and commodities. EPU, I think, is – look at the European banks left for debt. Look at Peru, EPU. Yeah, I was basic material related. Look yeah. at that. Wow. Uh, look at um, XLE. I mean, I'm long XLE. Uh, I'm just – these companies are printing money right now, and that is a great base. Um relative strength rising, this could go, could 
could go. So I, not, I would love to gonna, actually it's not gonna uh, double. It's not going to double, but like that's not the way the markets work all the time. There's nothing wrong with quick 20, 30 percent gain. Look at gold. Like when it broke out, finally, it was a quick 20 percent move. I would love to bring up uh, you know some of the community comments here because I think they relate to some of these kind of bigger topics and, and hit on some of these trends. And so, uh, you know, starting off with one of the, our, you know, our longtime users and one of my favorite guys, uh, Synaptric on the streams, he was talking exactly about this, which is the fact that, you know, lagging oil stocks are now catching bids. And, you know, is this a genuine new trend happening you know, in oil? Um, you know, sentiment is still really brutal around these names. You know, is this, is this time to, you know, think about, you know, thinking about some of these longs now? There've been some hot setups in uh, in oil stocks. Stocks that are looking a lot better than XLE, and as Howard pointed out, XLE is looking uh, very constructively, like FTI, TDW. There's definitely been some interesting uh, setups in in the energy space um, in the past few weeks. So if you're just a purely technical, just based on the technical action, you know you you know you you could have been long some of those names, even not knowing anything about the fundamentals and interest rates. Well, you could look at the Honda chart versus the EV chart and go, wait a minute, hasn't the story been electric over oil for the last six years, seven, eight years? And if you look at the Toyota stock, shouldn't you say, well, if hybrids win, that's a little better for oil than just EV. So there's just that, just that little tick if Honda and, and Toyota hybrids are winning. Uh, that's That's... Half oil is better than zero oil. I'm talking about if you if you care about oil. I don't care about. If you either. wanted to bet on the uh, trend, what what specific tickers are you are you looking at uh, to to you know go long? I'm not good enough, so XLE is should should provide or you know enough boost. I'm not going to dig into the tickers. I'm just going to go ETF. Cool, makes sense. All right, any any other thoughts on oil and the trend? You guys covered it pretty well. All right, yeah, I mean, I'll move on to uh, move on. Go ahead, move on. No, move all right. On. Uh, so we got the powerful Don Corleone. You're know, asking kind of a you know taking a, take, take, taking a step back. You know, asking more kind of big four macroeconomic tailwinds. You know, like wh- what are the big risks that you see from a from a long term perspective in markets here, um, looming a you know any apocalyptic scenario. So to, wh- what are the big risks in equity markets right now? I mean, one of them is, uh, you know, if inflation comes back, even though the, the Fed has shown that um, they're willing to keep interest rates high and, you know, but if the inflation persists and it, if they have to uh, raise rates, that would be a huge surprise for the market. And we will see a pretty significant pullback if they have to raise rates at some point, even if it's just 25 basis points. Uh, that will be a huge surprise for the market because it's not priced in. The market is, is priced in um, 75 basis uh, points of cuts this year and a lot more than, than that next year. So and anything in, on, on that front for me would be a, a big shock for the market. And obviously with the election coming up in November, we're going to see the usual uh, heightened volatility ahead of them. Um, these are the, the two main uh, events that I see that could cause uh, a lot of volatility in the market and, and some uh, significant short-term pullbacks. Howard? Um, for me, I'm, I'm watching two things, right? In the digital world, we're seeing really silly, frothy behavior. You know, I can't, you can't, it's like Coco, I can't cover everything, but I can, one thing I believe and feel is that the crypto market kind of takes care of itself, right? You get this money made in Bitcoin, Ethereum, let's call it Solana to the big three. And then that money creeps into speculative, you know, digital assets. It's the same cycle over again, only to get lost. The good thing about crypto and it kind of kill, it kind of kills its own inflation by um, the few uh, leading the many into the slaughter in, in, in shit coins. It, right now you see it in meme coins, which is a more fun version of shit coins. Um, What's great about that, you know, great, I mean, there's nothing great, it's fun. What's interesting about that is it's killing its own inflation. That money is staying there, not buying goods and services to drive up. You know, in the old days, and when it was just the stock market and then in the 90s, you, 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 you get this behavior where people go buy apartments and Porsches and spend their money at bars and strip clubs and whatever men did 
that made money in the markets. It would come out of the market and get spent on bonuses, et cetera, in Wall Street, and it would drive uh, prices up. In the crypto market, they had, they, they're, they're farting around. They're just lighting their money on fire. So it kind of kills its own inflation over there. So, so again, I don't read too much into the speculation that's happening in crypto because the money burns itself. Okay. In the real world, we just, we do have inflation. Of course we have inflation. The world is shrinking and, and you have these massive wealth differentials, right? So of course you have inflation, right? And you have money printing that's gone on forever. But at the other hand, you have this incredible amount of money in the system, right? That wants to be invested. So you're seeing this rotation that Ivan and I have been talking about for a while, which is generally healthy. So until kind of, I see something different, the trend remains your friend. Um, you're seeing pullbacks in software. It's not like easy to make money every day in the stock market. So I think it's pretty healthy behavior overall, but just people should realize that, you know, maybe they don't cut rates and that maybe prices like Adobe are risky because they're 30, 40 times earnings and there's very little room for error. So, so not everything is working. We had a uh, Raul Paul come onto our platform uh, this week and, and offer and do do a great AMA. And one of his big bets is, you know, he's very bullish on crypto and has you know most of his assets tied up in this space. And one of the things that you know, we didn't really get to, and, and I thought it was a good question, is if you're someone that has most of your assets tied up into crypto and Bitcoin specifically, you know, what comes to mind as a way to hedge that bet? Well, if you really are a Bitcoin maximalist, and I know a few, and I had dinner with one uh, last week in L.A., um, whose friends are not Bitcoin maximalists, and he's been right, and he continues to believe that Bitcoin is really the only hedge against what's going on uh, in the world and really understands how to buy Bitcoin and very comfortable you know, selling his real-world assets to own Bitcoin as the only way to you know, preserve capital for generations. Um, I'm sure if you talked to gold people a thousand years ago that were hoarding gold, you would have called them insane. So, and it's been a pretty good hedge over thousands of years. So, again, I, I think, you know, Bitcoin in a short period of time has proven that uh, it's, it's like insanely maybe the best asset over the first 14 years of any kind of category. So I'm not going to be the person that bets against it. Um so, you know, I don't think there is a hedge. Why would you hedge something that's working? You hedge it by like finding a better asset or by finding something that's the opposite. And the opposite of Bitcoin is something with infinite supply. And why would I want to hedge it with that? Um, so, no, I think the people that own Bitcoin and love Bitcoin have a thesis and it's not broken and they're going to continue to hold it. Go ahead, Ivan. I mean, I don't know how to hedge it. I really don't know. I, I assume that most people that have a lot of money in uh, in Bitcoin also have a lot of money in other assets, and they're, for so them, far, their yes. hedge is Bitcoin is their hedge. Um, Correct. So you don't hedge a hedge, meaning the people that love Bitcoin, that is their hedge. Five minutes. All right. All right. Really appreciate that. Um, all right. Let's wrap up. Uh, give the people as far as uh, you know what what on your radar for next week you know what are the big plays that, that stand out to you and, and what looks interesting just for uh you know people to keep an eye on i mean i don't have any interesting oh, for next week i know that nvidia has their uh big ai conference so we, we might see some bounce there earlier in the week right before the fomc uh, it will be interesting to see if uh, semiconductors attempt uh, a short-term bounce and if it will hold or they'll just continue to roll over so this is something that i'll be watching for really short-term trade uh, in semis, uh, like Monday, Tuesday. For me, just to not be political, but the TikTok thing is so interesting, right? Oh, yeah. Um, Let's see how uh, Meta reacts in Google. Yeah. So, so Reddit is about to IPO next week. What I mean, What's on the radar I, I, I as far as that? Incredible segue into like what's an important topic to me. You just cut me the fuck off. Sorry. I'm sorry. I thought it was relevant. I uh, read it. Social media, TikTok. It's it's in the yeah, cards. Yeah. Okay. So So let's just take two seconds here to talk about what I think is super important, meaning I started stock twits. So I think I have a little skin in this game. Um, I didn't start with Twitter. I can't believe how little, I, you know, I've, I've quit it many times for a week or two or three weeks. Um, I can't believe how little I use it. Um, and I can't believe how much my wife, Ellen, 
uses Instagram Reels. So if you'd asked me, you know, a year ago, what, could I take Twitter off my iPhone? Uh, I said, no, I'd keep it there forever, you know, but it got me so angry that it's very unproductive app, like probably the most unproductive of all the apps, right? And if you ask a lot of kids about TikTok, they will tell you straight to your face, fucking addictive, right? I see it. They tell you this. They have to like literally pull themselves away. Then if I watch my wife at any spare moment, she's hooked on Instagram reels, not watching politics, but makeup, food, um, you know, influencers. So we live in this really niched off world. I think social is dead. I think it's alive for marketing and it's alive for, you know, people, everybody has their different category. I don't think Twitter is dead. I think it's dead as it once was, right? You saw Elon this week kicking off Don Lemon after saying it's a free speech platform. How many times does Elon have to lie straight to your face and say Twitter's free speech before he does something? TikTok is an incredibly Chinese company. Okay. You can you say what you want. Uh, the fact that it got away with what it got away with in the light of Facebook and Twitter not being allowed in China is crazy. But what creeps me out is who puts up their hand first in the United States to buy TikTok? Steve Munchen. Okay? Like, that's disgusting. That uh, First of all, that he's just so full of himself that immediately he puts up his hand. It's the last people that I trust to run TikTok in the United States is you know, Uber Republicans or Uber Democrats, right? So, you know, we're going to be very careful of the overlords that we're going to get when TikTok is now distributed by Congress. So I worry about that. Reddit is the internet. Okay, I've said this before if we pull up Reddit. I am very fascinated by this story because very few people have a strong opinion about it. Okay, so it'll be really interesting to see when something is this deep into the and spread out around the world as one of the largest sites on the internet, how it behaves when it actually goes public. I mean, Tommy, you probably have the most to say about this, so we'll let you chime in. But I don't know what will happen with this. It, it does not make money. Uh, I'm skeptical of, um, I don't use the product, but I'm skeptical of these deals that they cut for, for data, right? With, you know, Sam Altman being on Microsoft, you know, being open AI and spending, you know, what they're going to spend on data, and he's the largest shareholder of, of Reddit. So I'm really, I really don't know what will happen with the stock. I do know that they'll have 800 million ish if the IPO gets done. And like I said with Robinhood earlier, that's an incredible amount of money in a very overvalued stock in today's world to go do acquisitions and become like a niche. They could own a lot of niche media businesses and really do the Twitter playbook of, of being the place, right? To just slow down Reddit, to give it more signal for regular users. So I think there's an incredible chance for Reddit to parlay this IPO into being one of the best media, forget tech, being one of the best media companies in the world. They could go buy Barry Weiss. They could go buy Comedy Central. They could go buy a lot of things. Um, and and so one of my thesis is, guys, sorry to go on the song, is that if we really look at the three of us, different ages, different places we were born. I think we would all agree that like, it's really only 10 to 20% on each side that's far right or far left. And that, you know, the middle is 50 to 70% of people that on, on any eight topics, we're going to see important topics. We're going to see pretty much eye to eye. And so I think Reddit has that chance. I don't know if they're thinking this, but to be that middle, you know, and to really, you know, give people both the edges and the middle. And, and, and that's what I'm excited about. What Twitter did wrong with the middle is by focusing so much on the right or the left, because that's who Elon is. When you're in the middle and both sides seem crazy, you just leave. You're just like, I get what they're doing to me here. They're making me crazy. And that's what Twitter has done to the middle. So I think Reddit should do the opposite and embrace the middle. And so I'm excited to see it as if they're thinking that way. Um, but that to me is the best long-term play is to use their edge knowledge and own the middle. But are you buying the IPO? How works? No, I, I never buy an IPO until it trades for a while. Um, so no. You're not, you're not as excited about Reddit as you were for Chipotle. 
Right. Program. Chipotle's, Ivan has a great memory. Chipotle's the first, because of my daughter, 20 years ago. Uh, we bought that stock the day of the IPO. Didn't hold it till today, but uh, it was probably the only time I've ever bought an IPO and didn't care what the price was. Good, good memory, Ivan. So you have a good track record with buying IPOs then? Yeah, I just think as a regular user, why are you going to trust the banks to price this? Like, you better have some really inside feeling. Uh, I've, you know, Cloudflare is something that I was, um, I was in the friends and family offering and got to buy some shares at the actual, I didn't have to pay up. I got to buy some shares at the actual IPO price, which is another reason I like to buy IPOs. I didn't even know that work that, that, that existed. So, um, no, let it season, let it trade for three to six months. Um, uh, that's my opinion there. Ivan, you're the same way, I think. Yeah, I would wait. Definitely. Okay. But, uh, all right, guys. How excited are you? Wait a minute. Tell me how excited are really, you? I'm really excited. Like, I, I think I, I view it a little bit differently in you where I, I actually do see Twitter as a kind of middle platform. And the real strength of you know, why I'm betting on kind of stock tweets and, and Reddit as a whole is because I believe in the nicheification of communities. And what's ultimately interesting is that you can go to a Reddit, uh, a, sub, a water subreddit, and there's going to be a thousand people with incredibly strong opinions of the best way to drink water. And I think that the future of the internet is going to be built around these niche communities, uh, the, the you know having a very particular interest in being able to verticalize that to the nth degree, and that's what the subreddit communities have been so successful at. And you know, as far as being able to run a business, I have no clue. But I mean, that's the future of, of the internet and online community as a whole. So, you, but you just endorse what I'm saying, and that's because you're smart. But you just didn't realize what you said. They own the niche. When you own the niche, move. If you truly own the niche, that turn the data, like we're doing at StockTwits quickly with Trends with Friends and other things. When you own the lean in and when you own all the smartest people talking at a granular level, you need to inside out it and give people a much cleaner look. I don't drive into Reddit because I can't, don't want to be an expert in every subject. So I think Reddit has this, this chance to kind of, since I already own the granular, to present it in a way that's like Reddit lean back which is kind of like what YouTube did with their homepage. We need a better view of how deep these niches go. And Reddit's in the best position to do that. Yeah. And Twitter has done a terrible job of that. Yeah. So I disagree with you on the Twitter thing. I, gar I believe with this $800 million, and if they really are good management, they could flip it and turn Reddit inside out and create the best media company in the world. I'd agree. I'm not betting against them. Come All right, guys. Here. Really appreciate right. your time. Thank you all for tuning in for another I, episode. Hang on, and, uh, hang on. Ivan, how's the baby? Oh, he's doing really well. Uh, you know, waking up every couple hours. So it's difficult. <laughs> well, that makes me smile. Someone yeah. else should be looking up. Hey, Ivan, how many languages does the little guy speak? Oh, I'm, I'm talking to him in two, in two languages. So I hope to are you? in Bulgarian and English. So. Good for you. And then is he playing volleyball yet? Not yet, but I'm hoping soon. Yeah. Are you playing YouTube volleyball videos? <laughs> Not yet. And then when can I see him? I don't know. Maybe in a couple of weeks. Are you in San okay. Diego? Okay. Yeah, I'm in San Diego. So we'd like to come see him. Okay, we'll figure it out. That was a no. Did you see that, Tommy? Just blew me off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate right. it. Bye. See you guys. Bye.